Welcome, everybody. How you doing? Say a prayer for us in Jesus' name. Hopefully, it'll be a fruitful discussion. It's kind of late. This is another impromptu discussion. There was an Orthodox Jew who is running his mouth off in the comments section. So hopefully, it won't be a waste of your time. It won't be a waste of my time. We'll trust the Holy Spirit to take over. So let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, we need you. We depend on you. We cling to you. <clears throat> We trust in you. We hope in you. We love you, Holy Spirit. You are real. You are almighty. You are sovereign. Eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son. Take over this session. Take over our ministries. Take over our lives. And Holy Spirit, please give me the health I need to glorify Jesus Christ. Fill me with life from your presence. All of us with spiritual, emotional, psychological, and physical life. Nourish us and feed us off the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ, your eternal companion, spiritually, emotionally psychologically and physically. I pray that for our loved ones, my daughters. And Holy Spirit, heal us by the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Make us whole, our loved ones, my daughters, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically and physically. And please fill my throat, my lungs, my chest, my arteries with health, from, with life from your glorious, beautiful, holy presence. You are the Lord and giver of life. Speak perfect health to my throat, to my voice. Strengthen it and enable me to recall scriptures perfectly. To interpret them correctly save me from stammering and confusion and error and grant us all every one of us enlightenment wisdom knowledge understanding from your glorious presence holy spirit to interpret scripture perfectly save me from outbursts of rage send a spirit of confusion on all blasphemers who will blaspheme the lord jesus and to interpret scriptures for the glory of jesus christ take over holy spirit we need you i need you not just to preach but to live please nourish us and feed us and convict this man if it's your will to see the true Messiah, Jesus, and the true nature of God, and confound all attacks of Satan, all blasphemies, be glorified in and through us, and glorify your companion, the Lord Jesus, the Father, Son, and glorify the Father in and through us. We need you. We depend on you. Please, Holy Spirit, do not let me shame the Lord Jesus or dishonor the Lord Jesus or blaspheme the Lord Jesus. Bless us all for the glory of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. So we'll see. <clears throat> Let's see. I don't know. I may be wasting your time. If so, we'll open up the Q&A. Let's see. I don't know. All righty then. Okay. So you're listening. Can you mute your computer? Oh, sorry. Just a second. Can you hear me? Yeah. You just blew my eardrums. So yeah, my apologies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so... We were commenting in the comment section and offering criticisms. So what exactly are you trying to prove that Daniel 7 is a dream when you acknowledge it's the Messiah? What does that prove? That I acknowledge that Daniel 7, 20, or sorry, Daniel 7, 13, 13 and 14, 14 is the Messiah, right? So when I look at Daniel 7, I see it's a dream. That is what has being... that got to do with the point? Because God often speaks to prophets in dreams like he did to Joseph right. and as well he did to Solomon. So what exactly are you saying? Because you're saying nothing. Oh, well, the beginning starts out as a dream, but what's helpful to us is we have an angel who Daniel actually asks what the interpretation of the dream Yehuda, is. Yehuda, Yehuda, you're not listening. Listen to me. I know your games. I just told you, your rabbis, even the Talmud says, the son of man is Messiah. Do not dare try to interpret this collectively about Israel because you're going to embarrass yourself. Um. Well, do you I accept it's Messiah? Is what it actually says. Do you it's accept said, okay, it's Messiah? Let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Yes. There's beasts in Daniel's dream, right? And what do they represent? Does that a little beast. That what do they represent? Beast? Stop talking over me. What do they represent? The beasts. They represent kingdoms, right? No, they don't. They represent kings with a kingdom. You can't have a kingdom without a king. So I'm going to ask you again. Oh, okay. okay. No, Yehuda, I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to now give you Chabad.org. Rashi says it's Mashiach. I have it up right now. Okay. Read to me what he says. Who is the son of man? Stop your tabnets. What does he say? Who is it? Read it. 
He says that is King Messiah. Okay, so stop your games. It's King Messiah. What's your point? Now? In the dream, he says that it's representative King Messiah. You know he what didn't he say says representative. He says it's King kings. Messiah. He didn't say representative. Said, well, King Messiah is representative of Israel, is it not? Okay, so do you agree it's the Messiah? I believe in the dream, is the it King Messiah? Messiah is representative of. Do you the want to hear? Do you want to hear dial tone? So you admit it's Messiah. Now the Arabic verb pilach, pilach, in mm -hmm. the book of Daniel. Pilach, yeah. do you know what that word is? Yeah, like... Okay. Can you show me where Pilach and, and Daniel... Serving, can yes. you show me in the book of Daniel, the Aramaic portion, not your later rabbinic tradition, which comes after the time of Christ. Show me in the book of Daniel where Pilach is given to someone other than God with God's express approval. So if we look at the same chapter, Daniel yes, 7, Daniel 7, 27. It's not plural, right. by the way. There right. is no plural pronoun in the, in the Aramaic, so don't play your games. And Why sister, is it saying that the kingdom, it says the kingdom and dominion, it, the kingdom, right, by the way, in the dream, right? Yeah. Who is given Who is given the kingdom in the dream? Why don't you go on and see what the word for most high is? What's the word for most high? Who is given the kingdom in the dream? I ask you a question. Okay. Who, who is given the, the kingdom in the dream? The saints of the people of the saints of the most high. But that's not what in I the asked dream, you. In the dream, it's given are to Are you Messiah. talking and over me? Or are you going to listen for the answer? I know you're excited. In fact, it's not. Okay, what's the word most high? What's the, the word dream. most high in Daniel 7, 27? What's the word? your mistake, but anyway. Daniel what's 7, the word most high so I can bury your rabbis with you in Daniel 7, 27? What's the word? Oyonin. Okay, is that singular or plural? That is plural. Okay, now secondly, the word pilach. In that verse, who is it being given to? It's given to the people the most. No, it's not. Uh, You're lying through your teeth. You're lying through your teeth. It doesn't say the people. It says it's given to the people the highly. No, it's not. It says that the kings will serve and obey. The pronoun is not in the Aramaic. It must be supplied. The nearest antecedent is Elionin. Who are you lying to? Who am I lying to? We can look at verse 18 and it says it's given to them. It says the No, Pilak is not given to the saints. In, in show eternity. me, read 18, read 18 and show me where Pilak is given to them. Read it. It says they will receive the kingdom. It says I didn't ask you that. I know you're pretending to be listening. Show me where Pilak, that was my question. Where does right. Pilak, where is that given to anyone other than the true God in Daniel? Pilak, I didn't ask you the kingdom. In, in that particular pasuk, in that particular verse, it doesn't say that. Okay. So, so in Daniel 7, 27, that, Daniel 7, 27, Pilak is given to who? Pilak is given to the, the high holy ones, the people of the most high. High holy ones. Can you show me where Elionin is used of the people as opposed to the true God? Read verse 25. Read verse 25. Elionin? Oh, you mean, right. Okay. Read so, verse 25. Read it out loud for us. Oh, verse 25, it says, he will speak words against the most high and he will oppress the high holy ones and he will think to change the times. Why, the when you by say, the, hold on, wait, wait. When you keep saying high holy ones, why are you translating it high holy ones? When in the context, the Elionin is synonymous with the most high just mentioned earlier in the same verse. Elionin is plural. Yeah. Uh, so Elohim is plural. What does that mean? It can be Elohim is plural things. in Daniel 3.25. What does that mean? It can mean false gods. Elohim can actually mean okay. false gods. But it's used of the true God in Genesis 1.1. Are you going to say now God? It can be. It can be. It's okay. similar. It's very so similar. So let's come word. back to the issue again because you're wasting my time. Why contextually Why contextually are you rendering Elionin as a reference to the people of the well, saints of Most High? Sam, that's a perfect example. It's used in a similar way. It can be used. Let's try this again, Yehuda. I know talking over me. Yehuda, to you're going to hear a dial like tone. Yehuda, I know you think you're answering me. Listen better because I'm going to embarrass you. Let's try this again. In Daniel 7.25, Elionin is used synonymously with the singular form of the Most High in verse 25. The referent doesn't change. So why are you now trying to translate as a plural in order to connect it with the people of the saints of the Most High when nowhere in Daniel 7 is that word used of them unless you assume well, and beg why, the question? Why would, we not, why would we not interpret? Okay, so let's Very go back easy, to Pelach. Because, let's go to Pelach, right? Yes. I, in the previous video, right? Pelach, this is the verb that you were saying. Yeah, show me where it's used specifically. for people other than the true God in Daniel. Right, okay, fine. But you used in the 
previous video when that one I was listening yeah. to, yeah, you said that, do? right? You said that uh, Oved or Avod, that that is used in the Hebrew equivalent of that word, correct? No, I didn't say that. No, you're twisting my words. You're lying through your teeth. I never said Avod. No I never you, said you, Avod. Let me make my point because you lied through your teeth like your rabbi. I didn't I, it's, you used it as Avod. I never said as Avod as is used. Five, in. Yehuda, I'm going to hang up on you. Don't talk over me. Listen, you little demon. I didn't say avod is used interchangeably for pilach. You're lying. I didn't say I'm that. I'm not lying. You were unclear. I did not video. say that. You okay. can explain yourself. Okay. Well, now, Dr. Go to Isaiah 54 5. So I can, I can now go to Isaiah 54 5. Stop barking like your rabbis. Go to Isaiah 54 5. Shut okay, your mouth okay. and go there. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, go ahead. Read for me now, since you like plural. 54. Five. Five. Yeah. Read it for me. For your master is your maker, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Okay, what's the word master in Hebrew? Hebrew? Give me the Hebrew for master. Hebrew for master? Yeah, read it for me. Ki v'alayich asayich Hashem t'vaut shemahu. You went too far. Go back. What's the word oh, for master? Uh, oh, okay. Balayich. Balayich. Okay. Plural or singular? Um, singular. You know, I'm going to hang up on you for lying through your teeth. It's the plural of Baal, you liar. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, my apologies. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So is it plural or singular? Yes, we'll say it's plural. I think it's okay. Feminine. What's the what's what's the word maker? Is it plural or singular? You said it. Asayich. Asayich. I think it's feminine plural, yeah. Okay, so now since you were into the plural and you translate as highest ones in Daniel seven twenty seven, I want you to now consistently translate them as plurals. What uh, translate as plurals? What do you get? Sorry. Since you took Elionin and you translated as a numerical plural, highest ones, to try to connect them to people of the saints of the Most High. Now I'm going to have you translate those words as numerical plurals. Translate them as plurals. Translate them as plurals. So you're saying you want me to say that Translate the word for Baal and Asa as numerical plurals because you just admit they're plurals. Now translate them in English as plurals. Honest, honestly, dude, like when it comes to our understanding of the are you going to um, translate or are you going to preach a sermon look i'm not going to say i'm an expert in hebrew at this so point. why did okay. you come to my comment section and run off your mouth when you're not qualified i am qualified okay. and i'll tell you why okay because can you then translate people, i don't want to hear a sermon before, i care about god's explicit commands to okay, israel can you can you translate can you translate i'm gonna hang up on you can you translate i don't want to hear a sermon translate and translate what you want me to translate because okay. I don't feel confident enough okay. to translate exactly. Go to Exodus 24 versus I'm not an nine. Okay, go to Exodus. Man, but okay. I am an Go to Exodus 24. Exodus, Exodus 24 verses 9 to 11. Let's do it. Okay, go ahead. Read it for me. Let's read it. Read it. Go ahead. I'm waiting. You're telling me? Go read. Come on. Exodus 24, what? 9 what to possible? 11 versus 9 to 11. 9 to 11. Moses, Nadav, our, Moses, Aaron, Nadav, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel ascended. You slowly, the other guy slowly. Read this. You're reading too fast. Slowly. I know you're scared of that passage. Read slowly. I'm not scared of that passage. Okay, read it I'll again. Read it. Read it. And they, prayed, and, they, and they saw the God of Israel. They saw who? Wait, wait, wait. It's too fast. Who did they see? The God of Israel. And what did they see under his and, feet? And beneath his feet were like the foaming of forming of a sapphire brick, like the appearance of the heavens for clarity. Keep reading. The 11. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand, and they perceived God, and they ate and drank. Now, the Hebrew word for perceive, your translation is in perceive. It also means see, which corresponds right. to the fact they saw the God of Israel. So who did they exactly see? Well, you had... Forget the, me. Who did they what? exactly said? Forget me. I want you to go with the text. I Look, like you said... We have to look at the totality of scripture. Okay. My answer to you, you sure? is the same answer. What? You want? You sure you want to go totality? Because I'm going to give you ver verse after verse yes. where God appears. Yes. Go to Genesis 32. Give... Go to Genesis well, 32. Listen, 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 listen. I get my turn to show you passages as well. If you okay, want go to, to Genesis 32, 24 to 30. 
so far you've been directing every single passage here. I think I should have an opportunity. I know to you're show scared. You Go to Genesis 32, 24 to 30. I know you're scared. It's okay. Well, it's okay. I'll be gentle on you. An argument. To, you asked me how. I want to ask you a fourth time. Go to Genesis 32, 24, 30, because you said, "Looks, let's look at the totality scripture." I'm going to give you the totality scripture where God appears as a. Am man. I allowed to show you the context of? Okay, so what are you going to answer Exodus 24? Us? Or are you going to keep preaching? Who Will did they see? Show you it, dude. Dude, if you're not going to let me. Who show did you they see? The example. And it doesn't. Okay, what example you want to okay. give me? Let's see. Go ahead. Give me your example. I want to show you. I want to show you Numbers 12. You love this passage. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah because Moses, oh. Moshe sees the form of God. So what did he see? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's very interesting. So what did he see? What did he see? It says he experienced Tamuna Tashem. Okay, so experience mm -hmm. or saw. Why do you say experience? He saw, right? Well, here's something interesting about this, Sam. Guess what word is not present in Numbers chapter, uh, sorry, uh, Exodus chapter 24, when it speaks of, or sorry, guess what word is his feet and pavement under his feet. Wow, yes, yes so yes, does yes, your yes, God have feet? Wait, 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 wait does your second, God have feet? Then does he ride a pavement? Yes wait, or no? Wait, wait. Oh, just a second. So let's start at verse, let's, okay, start let's try at this again in wait, the wait, text. Wait, you no, read, wait, Yehuda, let, 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 okay, let, let, you're manifesting. Don't hang up on you. I'm gonna hang up on you. Let's try it again. In Exodus 24, did does your God have feet? Ah, uh, shut up and go back to your bastard, Rabbi. You dumb bastard. Stupid. Waste of time. There you go. There you go, guys. There you go. Okay, folks, we got a free night. This guy is the one who's gonna put me in my place. All right. So, guys, Skype is open. Do you want me to do a live QA? Call me. This is your time. Yeah, yeah. And these are guys I want to debate. Okay, guys, you want me to do a live Q&A for you guys? If you do, then call me. Skype is open or I'm going to shut down. It's up to you. Going once, going twice. Well, Skype is open, call. Because I didn't have a topic. I thought at least we're going to last more than 10 minutes with these guys. Anyway. All right, come on, you guys. I don't want to waste your time, man. Brother, Magrib, Magrib. If not, we'll just shut down, man. I know you guys are tired. We had a long day. The same thing. Yeah. All right, hold on, guys. Yeah. Can't even answer questions, dude. It's either your own Tanakh. Even if uh, Rashi says it's Mashiach, and he still wants to explain it away. I mean, what do you do with these guys? Damn if you do, damn if you don't. Okay, folks, I guess no one's calling in. Then that means we're gone. Thank you for all the cards and letters. All right, brethren. Guys, and then we're going to shut down. Uh, no one's calling in because I don't want to uh, just sit open here and talk about nothing. Timmy's doing better than you. All right. Okay, guys. Lord willing, maybe we'll do something tomorrow. This was a waste of time. I'll just delete it. Take care, guys. No one's calling in, so I'll see you guys. Oh, wow, me, me too. Here, man, I was about to hang up too. What's up? What's up? What's going on? This year, buddy, I can't hear you. This year, I can't hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Keep talking. Testing, testing. Yeah, go ahead. What is it? Talk to me. Yeah. Um, so this is um, so I have a sister. Only one and sister? You don't have more than one? Two. Okay, so what about your sister? Go ahead. I'm I'm not I'm not interested by the way. Don't try to fix me up. Hold on, I'm sorry. I'm gonna get mute. There you go. This year, buddy. Okay, so she has unfortunately fallen from the faith. Um, uh oh, we got ago. we got that noise in the back. Gee, you got that alarm. Do you want to change that alarm, man? I'll pay you for it. But anyway, I got like ten of them. So that's gonna okay, be yeah, yeah, you're gonna be killing us. So she fell away from the faith. Why? Um, and that's the thing, or this is getting complicated because it's gonna get to like, a little spiritual. So, um, so she has been experiencing in the past. 
Uh, spiritual attacks. Okay, so why would she fall away from the faith from spiritual attacks? I don't get it. Um, it's because she felt like calling the name of Jesus wasn't helping her. Okay, so and her logic, wait, let me guess. So calling the name of Jesus not helping her, so I'm going to just turn my back on Jesus and that's going to help me. Yeah, that makes sense, but go ahead. Yeah, and she ended up relying on other, on familiar spirits to basically witchcraft. Genius, genius. And she's she's saying that that has helped her yeah. um, with removing the other spirits that were attacking her. Okay, so so, so what? How, how do you want me to help her? I mean, what can I do for her? Not much. I want to, I, my question is like, what would be like the best approach when it comes to these spiritual experiences? Um, what would be like the best approach to... Um, you know, bring her back to the faith. How are you going to bring her back? You you can't bring her back. She has to want to come back. Where is she at now on her spiritual journey? She doesn't believe Jesus is the son of God anymore? That's the thing. She believes that he is and not at the same time. She thinks she can dabble with both. I mean, then she doesn't believe the Bible. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you're asking me a question. If she's a Christian, then she knows the Bible. In Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 14, and also as well as Isaiah 19 to 20, those who mm -hmm. follow Christ are condemned from consulting familiar spirits, dabbling into the occult witchcraft, so divination. So she's deliberately, deliberately sinning against the Lord by doing the very thing that Christ said she shouldn't do. So what can you, how can you help her? She knows what the scripture teaches. She's justifying her sin and rebellion because it works. So it's pragmatism, not what is true, what is scripture. Mm. So, I mean, what can I tell her? She doesn't submit to scripture. So what do you want me to tell her? Yeah. Uh, I was hoping that I can just bring. You can't bring anybody back, brother. No, I meant like a conversation that would like. Well, does she know the things. Bible condemns witchcraft and divination and the occult and spiritism? Um, I'm, yeah, I think she's familiar with it. Okay, and she still went against scripture? I think she's saying the fact that it's hypocrisy for, like, the Jews to do something similar to it, like incense and, um, basically blood sacrifices, and she's basically condemning Christians. So, um, what has the Jews got to do with her sinning against the word of God? I don't get it. She's saying because of the practices that she does, you can see it in the Old Testament. What practices is she doing? Where in the Old Testament they contacted familiar spirits? Um, like they say, she said they, um, like the, inc inc the incense. Incense to who? To well, a familiar yeah, spirit? It's, it's for the most high, but in, the, in, the, in, in scripture, but for her, it's just that it's the same thing. If you do okay, but you're, 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 I think you're confused. You're telling me she's contacting familiar spirits, but now she, you're telling me she's burning incense to God. That's not the same. What is she no, doing? No, I'm saying the Jews in contacts in the Torah, they did it to God, but to her, she's saying it's no what different. What is she doing? Doing it with her ancestors. She's burning incense to ancestors? Yes. And can she show me where the Jews did it in the Old Testament for ancestors as opposed to God? Pretty sure she can't. Okay, so in other words, she's a Jezebel who wants to justify her sin and perversion and will twist scripture to do so because the same Old Testament that she's appealing to where the Jews burn incense, they burn incense to God, no one else. The same Old Testament that condemned any Jew who would contact spirits, who would channel spirits, who engage in sorcery and witchcraft. So she selectively cites those parts of the Bible that justify her wicked, satanic lusts and passions. Yeah. So then how do you help someone that's going to pervert the Bible? She's going to learn the hard way. Watch what's going to happen to her. She's going to get demonized, and her life is going to be hell on earth. She's going to be an emotional, spiritual wreck because God is now going to allow the demons to torment her and destroy her and her pride and make her grovel before the feet of Jesus. That's what's going to happen because yeah, the she's, demons. She's that now. Bro. She's what? She's experiencing that. Oh, yeah. It's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. Because the demons will be very friendly and will appease you and tickle your ears and give you what you want in order to ensnare you. Once they ensnare you, then the facade, the mask is removed, and then their true nature comes to the forefront, and then they torture you and torment you. That's what's going to happen to her. And you said it's already happening. 
And that's what she's going to get because she's defying God, perverting scripture, making God bow down to her will, thinking she knows more than God and doesn't trust God to know what's best for her. So she's going to suffer. <clears throat> There's not much you can do for her, but pray that the Lord will use this chastening to bring her back. Right? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, I, can, I can read your mind. See? I can't hear you there. You guys not here. What happened? Oh. I'm here. So what happened? You went silent. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. I didn't know you were crying. I was looking at the comment section. Is she your sister or she's a sister in faith? My sister. Oh, man. Well, just pray for her, brother. I'm sorry. Now I see why it's getting emotional. Sorry about that, brother. When you said sister, I thought you meant, sorry, uh, a sister in the Lord. What you need to do, you need to just pray and fast for her, but you can't convince her otherwise. She's already made up her mind, which is why she's perverting scripture to justify what she's doing, right? Yeah. So you can't reason with her. All you need to do is pray now, cry out to the Lord Jesus. You got to pray and fast for her, not reason with her. She's beyond reason. Pray and fast that the Holy Spirit in his mercy will not allow her to stray so far, but let her suffer the consequences of her sin to break her and to bring her back to the feet of Jesus. <clears throat> so that's what you need to do, brother. Your reasoning with her is not going to work. No matter what you quote, she's going to justify what she's doing. She's going to twist the words of scripture. She's going to misinterpret it. Because she's happy in her sin. Right? Yeah. To her, it's yeah. pragma it's pragmatism. What works? In other words, the mentality is the end justifies the means. If it's going to get me results, I don't care what it is. If it's going to help me accomplish my goal, I'll do anything. Not realizing that Satan will give you what you want in the beginning to ensnare you, only to destroy you and make your life a living hell. And that's what's happened. Yeah. Right. But what you can do, you can get people to pray and fast for her. Because the almighty Holy Spirit, he's almighty over creation, not Satan or evil spirits. So you need to be praying for and fasting for her. That's all you can do. That through this experience, she'll be broken and driven to the feet of Jesus. <clears throat> <clears throat> Amen. All right. That's all you can do, brother. You can't do much. So that, I wish I could tell you you can do more, but you can't because she's already justifying what she's doing by perverting the Hebrew scriptures. So she's not interested in submitting to what the Bible says. It's not interested in doing what God says. She's interested in. And justifying what she does, even if it means twisting the Bible. You can't deal with it. You can't deal with that person. I know from personal experience, <clears throat> you can't deal with a, and I don't mean to disrespect when I say Jezebel. May God save her from that because it evoked my own personal experience where my ex-wife, who's a Jezebel, <clears throat> she would justify committing adultery by saying, well, that man is more Jesus to me. Because he laughs at my jokes and he loves to spend time with me, unlike Sam. And so he's more like Jesus to me than Sam is. What a filthy, wicked, satanic whore to justify her adultery by saying that man laughs at her jokes and loves to spend time with her and is open to the gospel as they are committing adultery and defiling themselves like two whores. See, that's a sick Jezebel. Who deserves the discipline of God. You see my point? Yeah. <clears throat> so you can't reason with a person that's at that level. You see my point? You yeah. can't reason with a person that's reached that level of perversion. Where to them, their lifestyle... <clears throat> is more important than doing what is right in the sight of God. Yeah. So you have someone here saying it's not a Sam stream if he doesn't bash his ex. Now, what do you say to a stupid demon like this that you'd get the impression that in every stream I'm bashing here, even though I'm trying to use that as an illustration to show you 
in my own life, when a person's at that level, you can't reason with them. But this dumb satanic bastard thinks that every stream I bash my ex-wife. What do you say with stupid demons like this, brother? Can you tell me? No. But anyway, brother, that's all I can tell you when it comes to your sister. You can't reason with her. I know from first-hand experience, you can't reason with a person at that level. Because you've reached out to her, right? Yeah, we had conversations. And you've shown her from scripture it's wrong, right? Yeah. And what is her response when you show her from scripture? Just that it makes sense, but also... And then, There's you know, always that but, right? Yeah. Okay, then that's it. Why are you going to reason with her? How are you going to convince her? What do you expect that you... You can say some magic formula she's going to see. No, she's at a point she doesn't want to submit to scripture. So just pray. Just pray. And fast for her. And that's it. Hand her over to the Lord Jesus. That's it. That's all you can do. Because <clears throat> when you try to do it in your own strength, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. I'm letting you know, look at me. That's why I'm mentioning my ex-wife, contrary to the slandering Wicked dog that said that it's not a stream if I don't bash my ex-wife. Because look at me, I lost everything. You know why I lost everything, brother? Because I tried in my own strength and my own wisdom to make things go my way. Look where I'm at now. So God forced me to let go and let God intervene. So you're going to have to let go and let God intervene in her life because she's not at a point where she can be reasoned with scripturally. Because anything you say, yeah, but... Yeah, well, what about this? You're wasting your time. Yeah. See? That's it, brother. That's all you can do. Now, when I say that's all you can do, meaning don't witness to her. Don't force God's word down her throat. Don't put her in a situation where she'll react and even then sin even worse by even coming to the point where she'll blaspheme the Lord. Blasphemy is his word. You don't want to get to that point. Pray for her and fast for her and leave her be. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's all you can do, brother. I'm sorry that you're going through this, man. I really am. I don't know what to tell you, man, because I feel it breaks my heart because I see how much you love her. But there's nothing you can do. Brother, listen, I'm speaking from experience. It wasn't my sister. It's my daughters. I lost them, and I have to let go and let God fight for them. When I tried to fight in my own strength, it left me homeless and it left me in another state where I haven't seen my daughters in over two years and I haven't heard from them over three months. See, when we try to do it in our own strength and not let go and trust God, who's almighty to save, then we're going to suffer. And we can then be used of the devil to get them to the point of even blaspheming the word more so than she's already doing. Let yeah. it go, man. Let it go. Pray and fast because Jesus is almighty. He is already wherever she's at. You can't go to all the places she will go. You're not omnipresent. You're not omniscient. Wherever she is, Jesus is already there watching. Right? Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12. Where can I <clears throat> flee from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. Even the darkness is light to you. Wherever she goes, God is already there watching. She can't escape God's presence and knowledge. She cannot, can't escape God's loving preservation of her life because we live because he preserves us. She breathes and moves because her life is in the hands of the triune God. And because her life is in his hands... The hands of the Lord Jesus, the hands of the Father and the Spirit. There's nowhere she can go to escape his presence. Trust him to watch over her and trust him to allow what must be done to break her and bring her back to the feet of Christ. <clears throat> Amen. That's all you can do, man. You can't do a better job than Jesus, right? Amen. All right, brother. I'm sorry to sorry, but if you have another question on something much more lighter than your situation, I'll answer, brother. I'm sorry you're going through this. I really am. But what can you do, man? Uh, some people they're stubborn. Look at Adam and Eve. Perfect world, perfect environment, no sin, no death, no misery. 
and still they were not satisfied and still God wasn't good enough and still God's command wasn't what they wanted. They want it more because the eye of man is never satisfied. And look at what their <clears throat> lack of trust in God. They're not being content with God's will for their life resulted in this pain and misery that we see all around us. And they were living in a perfect environment. The world was perfect. Food was perfect. Perfect lush garden. They could eat of any tree. They were just made from scratch by the hands of God, perfectly designed, wonderfully made, fully functional, operational. And still, in light of that, they were not satisfied. They wanted more, and look at what they got in return. And now we suffer because of that. Yeah. So that's it. Leave her be and let God take care of it. That's all you can do, brother. All right, thank you. I do have a question on uh, starting fasting. Yes. So, so I was doing mm -hmm. fasting this month. Um, my struggle right now is me trying to do food fasting. Right now, I'm doing social media fast as well. Yeah, as, um, that's good, but you got to do it the biblical way. You got to fast from food. Yeah, and that was my that was my question. No, yes, you, you got to do fasting the way the prophets the way the apostles the way the righteous the way the lord jesus fasted from food yeah fast from social media that's that's your sacrificing a fast is a sacrifice so you sacrifice money you sacrifice things that you may you know occupy your time which is not really a sacrifice it's your duty to make most of your time and use your time wisely for the glory of Christ. So sacrificing from social media, sure, that's a fast, especially when it's becoming addictive and it's hindering you from serving the Lord or spending time with the Lord or loving on the Lord the way you should. It's like a relationship. The more you spend time doing things other than spending quality time, let's say, with your family, then what that's going to do, it's going to put a wedge between you and your family, especially if you're married, you're not going to get away with it. If you spend most of your time on social media and you're married, you're going to end up divorced or you're going to have a wife cheating on you. Mm -hmm. Right? So if that's true with fallen human relationships, human affairs that are fallen and perfect and tainted, where if you don't give your spouse or your children or your parents enough attention and that can drive them away, how much more is that applicable to the God who perfectly loves you and has done you no wrong, but has flooded you in his love and done everything to demonstrate his love to the point of becoming flesh and dying a painful, excruciating death to demonstrate his love for you. How much more should you be spending your time wisely and giving the most of your time for his glory and giving him more attention than you already do? So wonderful, you're fasting from social media, especially when it's hindering you from being as devoted to the Lord as you should be, as we all should be. We don't give Jesus enough of our attention, enough of our time. We don't love him enough. We don't pray to him enough. We don't worship him enough. We don't spend enough time in his word. And we don't serve people by our deeds enough as an expression of our true love for him, that we're not lip service. So amen, you're doing that. But biblical fasting is sacrificing food. Why? Because when you sacrifice food, you are exercising control over your passions and appetites. Instead of your appetites controlling you, you by the strength supplied by the Spirit are controlling your appetites. And the more you can do it, the more you can overcome your sinful lust and your flesh instead of your flesh overcoming you. Can I, can I give you why I'm, I'm struggling with the food part? Of course, because they, your appetites control you. That's my point. But if people... Yeah will sacrifice food for a trophy like bodybuilders. Bodybuilders, they will kill themselves and sacrifice food and spend hours in the gym to the point they're about to pass out and die in order to get a trophy. 
How much more should you be sacrificing your physical appetites for the king of glory who became flesh and sacrificed his human life on the cross for your salvation? <clears throat> yeah. I, it's, less, it's, it's, it's less of my appetite and more of my body weight. Because I'm is a your, very small person. You're small. You don't look small, man. You look like a hefty brother to me, man. Really? Yeah, you look like you you thick bone. How much you weigh, sucker? One fifty. And what's your height? I'm six foot. Yeah, so yeah, for your height, one fifty. Yeah, you are a little on the lean side, but uh, that doesn't matter. In other words, by fasting, you're not going to starve and die, right? Mm -hmm. So don't use that as an excuse not to fast because you know what? Because of my weight, my friend. You've been a buck fifty how many years? Almost all my life. Okay, so what does you being a buck fifty have to do with hindering you from fasting? Whether you fast or not, you're a buck fifty, my friend. Yeah. And I, I don't expect you to fast. Little. I don't That's expect you to fast for 40 days where you become only a buck, 100. Right? We're talking about fasting for a period of time, but unless you want to try to do it 40 days, hey, people have done it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit indwelling them that worked in perfect union with Christ. We're talking about taking a few days out of the week to fast. Maybe fast on a Wednesday and then fast on a Friday, Friday like the early church did. The early church would fast Wednesday and Friday. Right? That was their practice. So you fast Wednesday and Friday. From evening to evening, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to drink fluids. And I'm doing that as an act of worship. And with the hopes that the more I resist the flesh, the more I've overcome the flesh, the more I yield to the spirit. So the more I'm in union with the spirit, the more I'll be able to live a life pleasing to the Lord and pray prayers that are in line with the will of God. Because it's the Holy Spirit that teaches you how to pray, what to pray for, and when to pray. But that only comes from you being so closely connected to the spirit, so in tune with the spirit. And completely surrendering to the spirit. The more you do that, the more you'll be able to then discern the spirit's voice and leading what to do, what not to do, and how to do it. I'll give you an example. Are you ready? Yeah. Open up your Bible, Acts 13, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> I hope I'm not putting you guys to sleep with answering this young man's question. Acts 13, verses 1 and 2. Watch. When did the Holy Spirit show up? When did the church discern the voice of the Holy Spirit as he spoke to them in a miraculous way, I believe audibly? Whereas with us, the Spirit can speak audibly where you hear him, or he can leave thoughts in your mind, impressions in your heart, promptings in your mind. Verses. Acts 13, verses 1 and 2. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius by Cyrene, 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 yes, Cyrene, Cyrene. <clears throat> Manian, a long life friend of Harold the Herod, Herod the Tetra, Herod, Herod the Tetra, and Saul. Yes. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, You see my point? When did the Holy Spirit show up? And speak to them audibly. And when were they able to discern and hear from the Holy Spirit? When they were worshiping and fasting. Is that a coincidence? No. You caught the connection? While mm -hmm. they're worshiping the Lord and fasting. Then finish it again. Read verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then um, after fasting. Now, before you, that, you, that was verse two. We'll get to three and four in a minute. Did you catch yeah. the connection? The more the Holy Spirit sees you sacrificing your flesh for the glory of Christ, the more the Holy Spirit will fill you and empower you to discern the will of God and then to act in accord with God's will. Then you will be a vessel ready to be used of the Holy Spirit because you're trying to empty yourself of your sinful passions and lusts so that you can be a pure vessel for the Holy Spirit to work in and through. Because sin grieves the Holy Spirit. 
And when there's sin, the Holy Spirit won't work in you, but discipline and chasten you. Mm. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Now read verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Cecilia. Cilicia, yeah. You're not going to visit any time. Then. So what happened? They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit spoke to them. Consecrate Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've sent them to do. And as they were fasting, they laid hands on them and sent them out by the Holy Spirit to these places, right? Yeah. Now let me show you again the benefit of fasting. Go to Matthew 17. I want you to read 14 to 20. What version are you reading? English Standard. Okay. Can you get the New King James? Sure. Okay. Open up the New King James for me. Guys, I hope this is benefiting, guys, honestly. I'm only doing this to serve you. And if it's going to bless all of you, this brother and all of you, then I'll do it for the glory of Jesus. Trust the Holy Spirit to fill me to bless you. If not, I'll shut down. I don't want to torture you guys. Okay, Matthew 17, 14 to 20. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic. Epileptic. He's an epileptic. He's like Muhammad. Uh, he's epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples. But they could not cure him. Guys, you got to bear with the alarm. It's not me. It's in his house. Uh, this is how it is. The alarm is going to sound off. Bear with it because I guess if he could close the door, he would. But unless we, I don't know how you sleep at night, but man, go ahead. <laughs> oh, you mean you could close the door? We didn't have to hear it. You left the door open? I, I mean, I have one in my room too, but let's hope that's not as loud. Okay, go ahead. All right, keep reading. Uh, verse 17, then Jesus answered and said, O faithful and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Now, all the way to 20, because you're going to see Jesus' answer in 21, but read all the way to 20. Let's get 19 or no, 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 all the way to 20, sir. Don't you skip. The disciples man. came to Jesus privately and said, Why should we not? Why could we not cast out that cast it out? Yeah, so Jesus said to him, Because of your unbelief, for un, for sure, sure, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there. Okay, now when you finish 20. Notice what Jesus says. How are you able to cast out powerful demons from people? Why did I say pray and fast for your sister? Because according to the Lord, not all evil spirits are equal. Some evil spirits are more powerful, more wicked than others. And the most powerful evil being is Satan among them. And I'm going to show you that from Scripture. And I want everyone to give me their attention for the glory of Christ and focus. Focus. That's the Holy Spirit to help you. Understand and guide me to speak truth without error. In the kingdom of darkness, there are some evil spirits more wicked, more nasty, more vile, more powerful than others. And the most powerful among them is Satan, which is why he can rule over them. Okay. Depending on the evil spirit that you come up against, <clears throat> just merely praying won't be sufficient. It will involve intense, fervent, effectual prayer and fasting to cast them out. Because now when you get to 20, read all the way to 21. I wish my sister knew that. Um, so move from here to here and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You see how do they come out? Prayer and fasting. You see why I said you need to pray and fast for your sister? You see that? Yeah. 
So that's my point. The Lord said, these come out only through prayer and fasting. You see why I was giving you that advice? Yeah. Okay, so, and it's also found in the Mark in parallel, by the way, Mark 9. So, you see, the Lord says, if you want to be powerful in the spirit realm, if you want to be mighty in the spirit realm, mighty against the kingdom of darkness, you cannot defeat them with physical weapons. You don't defeat them with guns and knives. You defeat them with the spiritual weapons that the Holy Spirit has given you, two of which is intense, regular prayer and fasting. That's Matthew 17, 21. You see the point? Yeah. And one reason why <clears throat> that is the case, because when you fast, you are warring against your fleshly appetites and you are conquering them. And the more you overcome your sinful appetites, the less authority Satan has against you. This is why this is going to make sense to the Catholics. <clears throat> Catholics, those of you who've listened to F Vincent Lambert and Father Ripberger, what do they say is one weapon against being demonized? A good confession. Why? The more unconfessed, unrepentant sin you have in your life, the more authority Satan and evil spirits have over you. Why? Because Satan's authority, Satan's power over your life is sin. The more you sin, the more you come under Satan's dominion. Because Satan's weapon to enslave you, to oppress you, is sin. Unrepentant, unconfessed sin brings about demonic oppression, if not demonic possession. Repentant, confessed sin frees you up from demonic influence and control, satanic influence over your life. Do you know that? <clears throat> the more you sin, the less you repent, the less you confess, conf confess, the more power the kingdom of darkness will have over your life because that's God's way of disciplining you. The Lord will allow you to be disciplined for unconfessed, unrepentant sin by allowing Satan and evil spirits to mess up your life and to influence your life, if not outright control you. That's what's happening to your sister. And that's why they, Jesus mentions that does even more demons more demons come even after like yes i'll give you that passage but let me show you where the bible says when you have a professing christian who's yeah. engaged in unrepentant sin and has been told to repent and they refuse to repent but justify their sin that's when god hands them over to the dominion of satan so satan can beat them and punish them and destroy their flesh in order to teach them the fear of god and draw them to repentance Go to 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. Hey, Aliatai, can you call me so I can piss on your prophet who is a con man and son of the devil? You're less man than Aisha. If you think you're intelligent, if you're that him, bring me because it was your prophet who was a con man who raped women like your mother, plundered people like your father and beheaded them. He's a con man and he's filth. He's burning in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. Now, Go to 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. My Skype is open for you. Instead of barking, call me. Let's see what I'll do to your prophet. It what Jesus already did by perfect. damning him to in hell. Go ahead, brother. Read 1 uh, Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immor immorality. immorality among you. Um, you're killing me, man. Pronounce these words. If you don't pronounce, I'll lay hands on somebody. Go ahead. I'm just stuttering out here. And such sexual immorality as it's not even name among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Now, what it means is even Gentiles wouldn't go so low as to have sex with their stepmothers. Even Gentiles knew having sex with your stepmothers, something abominable and disgusting and shameful. And yet you have someone who, confess, who confesses to be a Christian, who's taken his father's wife, who's taken his father's wife and has taken her to bed and is having sex with her, and he's parading her in front of you 
in your assembly and you're allowing him to come with a stepmother in your assembly and take of the Eucharist. What are you, stupid? Keep reading. See what he says. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourn that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed as absent in the body, but present in spirit. Now what he means is, let me explain that expression. I'm not there with you physically, but I'm united with you in the spirit. The same Holy Spirit that dwells in you dwells in me. So I'm united to you in this decision by the spirit. Because this decision comes from the spirit. So if you are united to me by the spirit, you'll come to the same decision. You understand this point? Mm -hmm. I don't need to be there physically with you to be in agreement with you. Because the same Holy Spirit that feeds and nourishes you, feeds and nourishes me. And if we're united by the same spirit, we'll come to the same conclusion. We won't differ regarding this matter. So keep reading. For well, I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you, you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see, when you have unconfessed, unrepentant sin, that's when God allows Satan to come in and discipline you and make your life hell and destroy you in order for God to get your attention, drive you to your knees, to cry out to Jesus to save you once again. You see the point? That's where your yeah. sister is at. Your sister doesn't want to repent. Does the want to confess. So you have to hand her over to the discipline of the Lord so she can learn to fear the Lord Jesus and with the hopes that as God allows Satan to mess up her life and destroy her life and make her miserable, that will then drive her to the feet of Jesus and the Lord will restore her and take her back. What you need to do for her is pray and fast for her. <clears throat> you see how it works? Yeah. Now, where does the Bible say not all evil spirits are equal? Some spirits are more wicked, more vile, more filthy, more murderous, more powerful than others. Go to Matthew 12, 43 to 45. Yes, Amal, it has everything to do with demonic attacks. I'm going to take your question. Amal said, since my reversion to Catholicism, I was attacked by demons twice. Both instances were when I was fasting. Don't you know why, Amal? As you go to Matthew 12, 43, 45. <clears throat> Even Satan attacked Jesus when he was fasting. Don't you know why, Amal, you are being attacked? Be wise as serpents, innocent, harmless as doves. Because your fasting makes you more powerful in the spirit realm. The more you fast, the more you pray, the more you study scripture, the more you meditate on God's word, the more you obey, the more deadly you become against Satan, and the more afraid he is of you. So what do... The evil spirits do distract you in order to discourage you from praying and fasting. Now, if you give in, then they know how to stop you from being a danger against the kingdom of darkness. You get it now, Amal? And the second reason is when you're fasting, that's when you're physically weak. And if you're physically weak, it, it impacts you intellectually, mentally, psychologically, emotionally. So... They take that as an opportunity to prey on you. She's physically weak because when you're physically weak, you have a hard time staying focused because you get agitated. You want to give up. So you're not at your optimal psychological and emotional state. So they prey on that moment, seeing that you are at a weak state and hoping that during that moment of weakness, they can cause you to succumb, stumble, and sin. And grieve the Holy Spirit. You got it? Don't fall for their traps and snares. That should motivate you. If you're being attacked when you're fasting, that's a sign you're doing something good. Because Satan won't attack you when you're doing something bad. He'll encourage you all the more to do something sinful and wicked. Now read Matthew 12, 43, 45. 
when an unclean spirit goes out <clears throat> out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So there are spirits that are more wicked than other spirits? Yeah. To finish it. So then he takes seven other spirits more wicked than him. You understand that even in the kingdom of darkness, there are some spirits more wicked, more vile, more evil, more powerful, more filthy, that even other spirits fear them. Even other spirits stand in awe of how wicked and evil these higher-ranking spirits happen to be? That's spirit realm is something else. <laughs> yeah. Now keep reading all the way to 45, finish it. He brings seven more. And they enter and dwell there. And, then, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. See? You see what the Lord is saying? Now, let me explain the point of that parable. The Lord likens your heart, your soul, your mind, your inner person as a house. You see, again, because that evil spirit left a person. That evil spirit left someone that he had possessed and oppressed. <clears throat> so the Lord likens your inner person your inner man, so to speak, your heart, your mind, your soul to a house. If the house is empty, someone has to occupy it. So learn what the Lord is teaching you. The Lord is teaching you, you are a temple, a house, a home. Someone must live in it. If God is not living in it, then it is Satan or an evil spirit. Do not de deceive yourself. No human being is empty. All human beings are homes, temples for someone to dwell in. So if God is not dwelling in it, then an evil spirit, if not Satan himself, will take occupancy in your heart, in your mind, in your inner person. That's what the Lord's teaching you. That's what he said. When he finds the house empty but tidy, that's what he said, right? You just read it, correct? You put in order. A house that's tidy, but still empty, having no occupant, then he not only re-enters that person, he brings seven more evil spirits to make that person's life much worse than it was before that evil spirit had left. His condition will become much worse than at the beginning when he was occupied by one evil spirit. You know what I mean there? Yeah. So this is what the Lord is teaching you here. <clears throat> What's the point? Either the triune God occupies you, either the Holy Spirit indwells you and fills you, or an evil spirit does. But there are no vacancies. No human heart, no human mind, no human soul can be vacant. It must be occupied by someone. You get it? Yeah. Are you seeing it, right? But I want you to catch, go back to 43, 44, read. When that evil spirit left the man, where did he go? Read for me where he went. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry mm -hmm. places. Notice he doesn't look for watery places. Did you catch it? Mm -hmm. An evil spirit looks for desert, parched land, wilderness. It doesn't look for watery places, right? Right. Okay, now, do me a favor. Go to Mark 5. Let me show you another connection. Verses 1 to 10. Watch where I'm going to go with this. Pay attention, guys. Evil spirits look for desert, parched land, wilderness, arid places, dry places, not watery places. Okay? You guys listening? Thank the Lord Jesus. We've got a good crowd, so we're going to go into some spiritual meat. Don't you like it when we go into spiritual issues, spiritual matters, and just dig deep into the scriptures as opposed to just debating? Yeah. Read Mark 5, verses 1 to 10, the demoniacs, legion. Then they came to the other side of the sea, 
to the country of the go ahead. Gadarenes or Gerasenes, doesn't matter. You're not gonna visit anytime soon. <laughs> and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. So he came out of what? Tombs, tombs. a graveyard. Pay attention. A demoniac is coming out of the tombs, graveyard. Let's see who's paying attention. Keep going. Wow. I have so many questions on that. Pass that line along. Verse 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs? And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces. Yep. It, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So he was far away in dry, arid places, mountainous regions, and in the tombs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, keep reading. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torture me, torment me. Yep. All the way to said, For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not be sent out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Okay, now pause right there. We're going to break it down. Notice demons dwell in tombs, dry, arid places, and occupy unclean animals. Pigs, they would rather indwell swine, which is an unclean animal by Jewish law, than be driven out of that countryside. Now, what's the implication? Why tombs? What do you find in tombs? Dead bodies. Mm -hmm. Why dry, arid places? Because scripture teaches if you are spiritually dead and you don't have the living waters dwelling in you, the Holy Spirit, then you don't belong to Christ. Why do they like dry places? Because a place that's watered represents a heart made alive by the living water is the Holy Spirit. John 7, 38 to 39. Read it. John 7, 38 to 39. Right here. John 7, 38, 39. This tells you where demons dwell and what do they like to occupy. John 7, 38 to 39. 38 to 39? Yep. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Yep. But this, he spoke concerning the spirit whom, whom the, those believing in him will receive. But the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Because Jesus was, has not yet been glorified. Did you catch it? Living waters, the waters of life, the springs of living waters, Holy Spirit. Why do demons like dry places, parched land, arid places? Because that represents soil that's not watered, a heart that's dead and not made alive by the Holy Spirit. Demons occupy spiritually dead people who do not have the living waters of life bubbling within them unto eternal life, who do not have the Holy Spirit. That's what you're supposed to learn from these examples. Evil spirits occupy people who are not born of the Spirit, who are dead in their trespasses, enslaved to sin. Those who are made alive, who are dead are now made alive, who are now born of the Spirit and have the Holy Spirit indwelling them, the spring of the waters of life, they are occupied by God, not by demons, not by evil spirits. Go to Colossians 2, verses 11 and 13. Are you, get, you getting it there or no, guys? 
So what happened, Ingrid? You got divorced? Why? I don't get it. You're telling me your married name, now your maiden name. What happened? So you got divorced? I hope not. We'll talk about the pigs in a minute. Okay. If you go to Colossians 2, 11, 13. <clears throat> in him, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by a circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So, and when, can you finish it all the way 13. Finish it. And when being dead in your tr trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive again together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Okay, so notice, someone who is spiritually dead, who doesn't have the spring of the water of life, the Holy Spirit, right? That is soil, that is land that evil spirits occupy. But once you turn to Christ, now you have the spring of the water of life indwelling you, the Holy Spirit who now makes you alive, unites you to Christ. Now you have God filling you and occupying you. So what's the point to learn from these examples? Evil spirits look for dead people who are dry and do not have the spring of the water of life living in them. Who are not born of the spirit, who do not have the spirit, who do not belong to the spirit, and therefore are not united to Christ. Are you catching the implication of why an evil spirit goes and looks for a dry, arid place? Or why these evil spirits drove the man to a graveyard, to a tomb? Because those physically dead bodies signify his condition that like them he's dead but he's dead spiritually while they're dead physically is it all making sense or no yeah everyone getting this even the people who are listening and in, in the youtube channel okay now now why pigs uh why don't you get it judeo-christian you maybe get blocked and i'm going to send you to another coalition Physical dead bodies represent the spiritually dead. Dry place represents those who don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them, filling them, causing them to be alive, uniting them to Christ. Because the Spirit is said to be the spring of living waters. You get it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone got it. Okay. Now, why then? No, Judeo, you shouldn't. Don't think you're dumb. You're not dumb. I hope you got it now that I repeated it, okay? If you're not born of the Spirit, that means you're dry spiritually and you're dead spiritually. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you're now alive spiritually and you have living waters flowing within you. That's spiritual waters, meaning the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is likened to water. Why? Because water refreshes you. Water cleanses you. Water gives you life. No water, you die. Likewise, without the Holy Spirit, you're dead. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't be cleansed. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't be refreshed. So no better apt metaphor for the Spirit than water. I don't drink water, I die. I have no water, I'm dirty. <clears throat> right? So water cleanses me, refreshes me. Without water, I can't live. Likewise, the Holy Spirit refreshes me, purifies me, and without the Holy Spirit, I can't live. So what an apt metaphor for the spirit, right? So now let's talk about, now Judea Christian, you got it? I didn't know, I'm sorry. I thought you were trouble. Thank the Lord Jesus, you're not. I hope you got it. Now, <clears throat> why pigs? Because according to the law, according to the law, pig is an unclean animal. Again, note the connection. Evil spirits only indwell that which is unclean. That which is clean is indwelt by God. You catch it now? Why are they asking the Lord, drive us into the herd of pigs? Because as far as the law is concerned, these were considered unclean animals, unfit for God's covenant people to consume under the Mosaic covenant. So again, what's the point here? You're supposed to see that demons only dwell, occupy that which is unclean. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but now... Notice the reaction of the swine. The swine <clears throat> ran off the cliff into what? What did they, when they, when the unclean spirits entered them, 
They ran off the cliff into what? If you read Mark, Mark 5, into what? The water, right? The very thing evil spirits hate. So note what the Lord is showing you here. Even an unclean animal would rather die than be possessed by an evil spirit. Even an unclean animal has enough common sense to not want to be possessed by an evil spirit. And yet human beings are comfortable being possessed by evil spirits wrecking havoc on their life. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So note, the very place that evil spirits hate to, to, end, uh, to dwell, watery places, is where they ended up anyway. And what was the cause of them being driven to a watery place? Unclean animals who had enough common sense to rather die than to have evil spirits possess them. And yet human beings who are supposed to be more sensible are okay with evil spirits possessing them and wrecking havoc on their lives. Is that amazing? Yeah. Are you guys catching the point? Another point you're supposed to see, that God values human life more than animal life. If there's a choice between a human dying or an animal dying, God will allow an animal to die over against a human because God loves humans more than animals. So whereas the Lord did not allow evil spirits to occupy a human being created in his image, he did allow them to occupy animals because animals are less in worth and value in the sight of God than human beings. God loves humans more than animals. It's not he hates animals, but if he's going to sacrifice one over the other, Animals we sacrifice in order to spare a human soul. Mm -hmm. So hope you got the point. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, it did. So, and all this goes back to using your sister as an example, a perfect illustration. Even though her love, her life is about to <clears throat> just become hell, it's spinning out of control. In spite of all that she's currently going through, and it's going to get much worse, instead of com coming to her senses and turning to Jesus and asking the Spirit to fill her and cleanse her of this unclean influence, she'd rather continue this path of destruction, showing she has less sense than even a herd of swine, that the moment they came in contact with evil spirits, they chose death rather than to be occupied by unclean spirits. Mm. You catch it? Yeah. Now, Beth is asking me, it's Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, where God distinguishes between clean and unclean animals and why these animals, well, he doesn't come out and tell us, but I'll give you an example of the wisdom of God. Are you aware, Beth, that every animal and fowl that God prohibits are scavengers? They feed off of dirt, rodents. So to eat them is a sure way of getting your, your body sick. What do pigs eat? Dirt, mud. So if you consume pig, it is harmful to your body. Think about the other things that God forbids you from eating. For example, catfish or shrimp. Catfish and shrimp feed off the garbage of the sea. Or eagles or hawks, they feed off of rodents, right? So notice the wisdom of God in that the animals and the fowls that he prohibits you from eating are exactly what Timmy's, uh, Timpy Bear said, bottom feeders that are unhealthy for your body to consume. So you see the wisdom of God? The things that he forbids you from eating are animals that feed off of debris, dirt, Garbage, they're bottom feeders, cockroaches, rodents, hawks, and eagles. And so, in other words, you see, sorry, I'm, I'm above from ring. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. In other words, you see God's wisdom in that the animals and the fowls that are proscribed, prohibited, are animals and fowls that are actually do irreparable damage to your body physically. So you see God's love and wisdom 
in prescribing clean animals that will not harm you physically because God is also concerned not just about your spiritual well-being, but your psychological and physical well-being. He's concerned He's concerned about all of you, the whole of you. Makes you, wants you to be whole and healthy spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. You see, there was a God, even fat. God said, you cannot eat the fat of the animal. It's forbidden. Go to Leviticus 17, 10 to 14, you'll read. He forbids blood and fat. Fat, you are not to eat the fat of animal. And we know that fat contributes to heart disease. Because as Sal John said, the triune God, Yahweh, Yahweh's Father, Son, and Spirit, knows what's best for you because he knows his creation better than creatures do. Got it? Even though now, even though now, as Christians, we can eat anything, that doesn't mean, though I have the freedom to eat anything, I should eat anything. Right? Moreover, the other reason why, Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy 14, God distinguished between clean and unclean animals, clean and unclean birds. You know why? The New Testament gives you the answer. There's another reason. It goes beyond the physical, the physical benefits and health benefits, right? The blessings of eating the diet prescribed by God, the health benefits, the physical benefits and blessings. There's a spiritual, deeper, rich meaning to distinguishing between clean and unclean animals, clean and unclean birds. You guys want to know what it is? It's found in Peter's vision in Acts 10, 9 to 29. I'm not going to read it. We're going to look at key points. Acts 10, 9 to 29. Peter sees a vision where he sees a table spread coming down. He sees it three times coming down. Okay. In that vision, he sees clean, unclean animals and birds. A voice tells him, the voice of God says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter's response no, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. The voice says, do not call anything common or unclean that God makes clean. He saw that vision three times. He didn't understand what it was. Now, open up, my brother, Acts 10, 17 to 20. Sure. Acts 10, 17, 20. Eating clean is not what makes you good. It's obeying God's command that makes you good. So if God tells you, eat this and you do, then you're good. Don't eat this and you don't, then you're good. So it's not the eating per se that makes you good. It's the compliance and obedience to God's command that makes you good or bad. Because what is sin? Breaking the law of God. Okay, now read for me Acts 10, 17 to 20. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he has seen meant, behold, the man who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whatever Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go, go down and go with them. Doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, how many How many men? Three. Now, notice who's speaking to Peter, the Holy Spirit. Notice who's commanding Peter, the Holy Spirit. Notice who sent these three men to Peter, the Holy Spirit. Now, notice how majestic, glorious, and wonderful and beautiful the Holy Spirit is. Number one, the Holy Spirit is a person. He speaks and commands. He's not an active force. So much for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Number two, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, God of the church. Because notice, he commands Peter. He tells Peter what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And Peter must obey or suffer discipline. So it shows you the Holy Spirit is the Lord, God of the church. He orders the church. He commands the church. And he tells the church what the church must do. Number three, notice it's the Holy Spirit who brings people to salvation. Because the Holy Spirit says, I brought these men to you. Do not hesitate. Go immediately with them. You see how glorious the Holy Spirit is? 
It's the spirit that convicts you of your sin. It's the spirit that makes you aware of your sin. It's the spirit that shows you you need Jesus. And it's the spirit that brings the right teachers to preach the gospel to get you saved. The Holy Spirit does it from beginning to end. You see how much meat there is about the Holy Spirit in those two verses? But another connection. Are you ready for another connection? You guys, are you all up and alert or are you asleep? Another connection. How many Gentiles did the Holy Spirit send to, to Peter? How many? Three. How many times did Peter see the vision of clean and unclean animals where God said, do not call anything unclean that I made clean? Three times. Three times, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why three times? Because each. each vision represented what? The man, the Gentile. Three men. Three men, three times he's told, don't call anything unclean that God makes clean. Because the threefold vision represented the three Gentiles whom God was about to make clean. Therefore, Peter, don't you look down upon them and consider them unclean because God is going to make Gentiles clean with you. But there's another reason why three. It is the work of the Trinity to make anyone clean. It is the work of the Father, <clears throat> the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit to make anyone clean. So three men, three visions, three persons of the Godhead, the Trinity. Sinking in? Yep. Because he went silent. No, I'm hearing you. Okay. Why three times? Three Gentiles whom God is going to make clean. But also, it is the work of the triune God to make anyone clean. It's the work of the Father, the work of the Son, the work of the Holy Spirit. These three persons of the Godhead, they alone are God who makes anyone clean. So now, let's see how Peter interpreted the dream. How Peter interpreted the dream. Go to Acts 10, 28. He's now entered Cornelius' house. In fact, read from Acts 10. Read 24 to 28. Watch here, guys. And the following day, they entered. Um, um, what? At the following day, they entered Caesarea. Caesarea Philippi. I can know. Uh, oh, man, I'm sorry. That's no, okay. No. You know why Cornelius? Caesarea Philippi is important? Why? Caesarea Philippi was the, the place where Peter confessed. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And, P and Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in, in heaven. And I say you are Kepha, and upon this Kepha I'll build my church. In Matthew, Matthew 16, 13 to <clears throat> 18, it was at Caesarea Philippi where the father revealed to Peter by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, which then moved Jesus to say, you are the rock upon whom I'll build my church, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Is it a coincidence this is the same place that Peter now opens up the kingdom of God for the first Gentile family? Is that a coincidence? Mm. You see the rock, Discharging the keys by opening the kingdom of heaven for the first Gentile converts at the same place where Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then I read 18, and I tell you, you are Kepha, and upon this Kepha I'll build my church. And then 19, in Matthew 16, 19, he says, And to you has been given the king, keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And here, that same place, Caesarea Philippi, Peter discharges the keys of the kingdom of heaven by opening the kingdom to the first Gentile convert in the very place where Jesus said, you are the rock, you are blessed, and to you have been given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Coincidence? Oh, no. <clears throat> are you guys being blown away? By how deep and rich, mute me, buddy. I can hear myself through your computer. How deep and rich the scriptures are. Now read 25 to 28. 
Got you. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I, myself, am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I shall not call any man common or unclean. Okay, I'm confused. When did God show Peter not to call any man, even Gentiles, that the Jews thought were unclean, common or unclean? When did God show Peter that? In his vision. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, if you guys have been paying attention, here is the interpretation why God during the old covenant period, distinguished between clean and unclean animals and other laws that were given for Israel because the animals represented nations. The clean animals and birds represented Israel, who at that time was the only nation set apart for God's glory, whereas all the other nations were allowed to steep in their sin. Now, however, the time had come for even the Gentiles to be made clean so now in making all the animals and birds clean, that was a symbolic act by God to showing that the Gentiles will no longer be alienated and considered unclean. The Gentiles will be now cleansed by the blood of Jesus through faith in Jesus, born of the same spirit, and they'll be one with you. So the animals that were given in the Old Testament were intended to point to a greater spiritual reality. Like there were clean animals and birds in distinction from unclean animals and birds. <clears throat> Similarly, the nation of Israel was that clean animal, that clean bird that God distinguished from the unclean birds and unclean animals typified by the Gentiles and their idolatry and immorality. But no more. No more. So everything in the Old Testament has a deeper more rich spiritual meaning. Everything, even the dietary laws, even the priesthood, the sacrificial system, or why the Jews could not use two different threads for clothing. All of that had deeper, richer spiritual significance that points to Jesus Christ and his church. All of it. I'm not exaggerating. The duty of the student of the Bible is to see how all these commands point to the Lord Jesus Christ and his church and his work on Calvary and bringing about all the nations, cleansing them by his blood, making them one with the commonwealth of Israel. Is that clear? It's, it's powerful. Hope that was clear. Any other questions or you're done, my brother? No, that's all my questions. I appreciate it. Lord bless you. My, my Skype is still open. We can go for another half an hour. And I will retitle this. Lord bless you, brother. Call me back. Now just pray and fast for your sister because now you know the solution and winning your back, right? Amen. So thank you, brother. We'll be praying for your sister. Pray for her, our brother's sister. Uh, well, his name is Edwin. That's all you need to know. Ask the Lord Jesus. Lord, have mercy on Edwin's sister. Save her from the sna snares of the devil. Bring her back to the feet of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Take care. Okay, let's see. Go, pal. I don't know if it's a Mohammedan. Okay, guys, Skype is open if you want to ask me any more questions. We'll take another half hour, I think, because we're close to the two-minute mark. And I'll retitle this. We, do, we did go into super in-depth spiritual stuff. Super in-depth spiritual stuff. Glory to Jesus Christ. I prefer you call me on Skype so you can read the verses for me, guys. <clears throat> Everything good is from the Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yellow. Hello. What's up, buddy? Nice to see you again. Uh, Talk hmm. to me. Yeah, I have questions. And Go ahead, brother. Uh, I was uh, listening to this clown, Eliate, and I took some notes. Yes, as you're talking... Marie Eunice, you have an Assyrian name. Are you a Syrian sister? Lord willing, I should start Messianic prophecies this week, unless people distract me again. Lord willing. Go ahead, brother. What's your question? 
and he said something like oh. he said something like ah, poo, poo, poo. the historians because he uh ran a uh, little louder um, brother i can't the, hear you the documentary hypothesis yes what and about the, documentary that the, the historian adheres to the prophet like moses is i can't Joshua. hear you if you're not going to talk louder brother then you can talk to timmy uh, uh the 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 historians uh, say that the prophet like moses is joshua uh, in contrast to the author of J jeremiah who thinks that he is the prophet. contrast to who uh, um how how contrast to who uh jeremiah the author the author of jeremiah thinks he is the uh, the prophet like moses in okay De deuteronomy 1818 what's the contrast uh to the, the the historians who thinks uh the okay. the prophet like moses is, is joshua yeah what's the objections the object objection is that uh, we are in trouble supposedly because is or, or joshua or um or uh, jeremiah but can who be said both. who said that who uh, said it can't be both Al aliatai who can say who said it? so Aliate, who is he I don't care who he is. Is he a prophet? No. Okay. So who said it can't be both when he shows that he's an idiot? Why is he an idiot? Because the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18 is not about a single prophet. That shows that he's stupider than Muhammad, which is why he won't debate me. The prophecy of Deuteronomy 18 is about a line of prophets that will start with Joshua, culminating with the Lord Jesus Christ. Who said it's about one prophet? Where did he get that from? Uh, he said that the, the word Navi in Deuteronomy 18, 18 is uh, Brother, you're not listening so either. That... You're not listening. Let me try it again. Pretend you're listening. Who said it's referring to one prophet just because it's singular? Are you smoking too or did you put down the pipe? No. Okay. Let me repeat it again. Who said it's referring to one prophet? Yes. Do you understand the contextual no. meaning of it or no? Yes, it's a line of prophets. Yeah, but uh, what's the proof? What's the proof it's a line of prophets? Uh, well, the, the prof, uh, uh, Joshua was anointed by Moses. No, that has nothing to do with it. Oh. Because you didn't read the context carefully. That's why you're letting someone as stupid as Ali Atai to trip you up. Go to Deuteronomy 18. Let's read the context so you can learn now what the context of Deuteronomy 18 is. Go to Deuteronomy 18. Read 15 to 19. 15 to 19. Yeah. So you haven't read the context. You let this guy take you on for a ride because he's a demon. I expect him to lie because he's like his prophet. But Muhammad was a demonic bastard who's now burning in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. That's why he can only do lectures on Muslim channels, but he'd never invite me so I can expose him because I will humiliate him and end his ministry like Jesus ended his fake prophet's life. Glory to Jesus Christ. But read Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desire of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly. Oh, did you catch it? Aha, uh -huh. wait, that's that's what you missed. Him you shall he heed as you desired at the day of Horeb in the assembly. This is what you wanted. This is what you desired, and then finish it. Uh, let me not, not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, mm -hmm. and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Okay, now, notice why God is telling Moses to assure the Israelites, I will raise up a prophet like you and put my words in, in his mouth that they must heed and obey. Because that's what they asked on Horeb. Now, let's go see what they asked on Horeb. Go to Exodus 20, read verses 18 to 23. Exodus 20, verses 18 to 23. 
Now all the people witnessed uh, the thunderings and the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear it. But let not God speak with us lest we die. Uh, did you catch it? Yes. Moses, we don't want to hear God's voice audibly from the mountain, nor do we want to see the cloud anymore. Because this is too much for us to handle. You speak to us directly. Now finish it. Keep reading. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you, you, you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. You got it now, right? So you understand what yes. Deuteronomy 18 is saying. You remember when I appeared to you in the cloud and you heard my voice audibly and you were so afraid. You said, Moses, you speak to us directly. We don't need to hear from God anymore. We know God is real. We know you're God's prophet. You speak to us. So now here's the dilemma. Moses is about to die since they don't want God to appear to them anymore and speak to them from heaven in an audible voice because it's too much for them to handle. What's going to happen now? Moses is dead. Is God uh, going to be silent? No, because no. from now on, I'll be raising up prophets like him and he will be speaking to you from me and reveal to you my words. That's how we know it's not about one prophet. It's a succession of prophets, an office of prophethood that will continue speaking to the people on God's behalf because God is honoring their request. You don't want me to speak to you? I'm going to send you a prophet like Moses, and he will speak to you from now on, now that Moses is about to die. So don't worry about it. I won't <clears throat> be silent. I won't abandon you, nor will you hear my voice anymore. Because I'm going to honor your request and raise up a man like Moses who will be my prophet speaking to you. Yes. So who was the first prophet to fulfill that role? Joshua. And then after him came other prophets. Exactly. Yes. So where did this pagan, stone-licking coward get the idea that Ram 18 is about one prophet? Yes. And You're now notice right. how this destroys Muhammad. <clears throat> Why? Notice the prophet is for Israel so that God's revelation will continue to Israel. But instead of God making known his revelation directly from heaven, he's going to send human male figures, as well as females, by the way, even female prophets, to then continue to make God's will known to them, which means that the prophet has to be an Israelite. It makes no sense for God to say, I'm going to raise up an Arab to speak to you when the context is, all right, God, we don't want to hear from you anymore. We know you're God. We know Moses is your prophet. Your voice is too majestic. We can't handle it. Let Moses speak to us. But now Moses is about to die. Then what? Don't worry. I'm going to continue this pattern and raising up human beings to speak to you, the Israelites, and continue to make my known will, my will known to you. How in the world does this make sense as a prophecy of an Arab? Yes, it makes no sense. <laughs> you see why I have no respect for Ali Atai? Why I called him out and said, Cow, debate me? Because I have no respect for yes. people who will pervert my Bible and assault my God in order to deceive people to follow a pedophile who's burning in hell. But any other questions, uh, he, brother? <clears throat> yeah, uh, no, uh, just to... Uh, make everyone know known uh, how stupid he is yes. he said that uh, deuteronomy 18 16 um rules out jesus as the prophet why because he said um that he will the prophet will be a mouthpiece of god and not god and since we claim okay. that jesus is god he can okay let me now destroy that prophet. argument you ready for me to destroy that argument Yes, please. You see why I tell you he's a fraud, he's a fake, and he's he won't debate me? Because I called him out. He won't debate me. You know why? Okay, he just said, notice the argument. See, the prophet can't be Jesus. Why? Because the prophet will speak God's words. God will put 
God's words in his mouth. Therefore, the prophet is not God, but distinct from God. Okay, go to Exodus 7, verse 1. Read for me Exodus 7, verse 1. So the Lord said, said to Moses, See, I have made you as a God to Pharaoh. No, wait, wait, wait. The and word as is not in the Hebrew. Literally, it's, See, I've made you, Moses, Elohim to Pharaoh. Read it again. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made, made you as a as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. Oh, wow. Now notice. The word as is not in the Hebrew. It's literally, I, I will make you Elohim to Pharaoh and Moses, your prophet. So that means the prophet like Moses has to be Elohim like Moses was. Mm -hmm. You caught it? Yeah. The yes. prophet will be God like Moses was. Now, Moses wasn't God in nature. He was God in function. He functioned in the role of God. He acted in God's place, so he's called God in that sense, right? Yes. So you see how it backfires on him? The prophet, like Moses, will have to function as God because Moses was God, Elohim to Pharaoh, and he had a prophet speaking for him, Aaron. In other words, it now backfires on him. Just like Moses was distinct from God and spoke God's words, but still functioned as God, the prophet will be distinct from God, but at the same time will also be God in some sense. Yes. So how does this refute Jesus being the prophet like Moses? Exactly. Because Moses is Elohim, God to Pharaoh. Aaron was his prophet. Now Moses wasn't God in nature, <clears throat> but God in position and function. Therefore, Jesus, to be like Moses... Would be distinct from God, but would also be God in some sense. Just like Moses was God in some sense. And that's exactly who Jesus was. He was distinct from God the Father, but also God in essence, which is why we're Trinitarian, because God isn't unipersonal. Yeah. You understand my point or I confuse you? No, I got it. Yes. Now, let me show you in what sense Jesus is like Moses and that he's distinct from God who spoke God's words. But like Moses, he's also God, whereas Moses was simply God in function. Jesus was God in essence and function. OK, now go to John chapter eight, verse 28. <clears throat> 28. Yeah, John 8, 28. Then. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I speak these things. So wait, he's like the prophet, like Moses, in that he only speaks what God tells him to say. Interesting. And that God yeah. is the father and Jesus is not the father. And yet he's also God in essence, like the fathers. So where's the problem? But I'm going to give you more. Now, with that said, read 29, John 8, 29. <clears throat> and he who sent me is with me. The father has no left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So you got it. I only speak what the Father tells me to say, what he teaches me to say, and I always do that which pleases him, even something Moses could not say. Now read John 5.30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will but the will of the father who sent me does that sound like the prophet like moses whom god would put his his words in his mouth exactly Sounds yes like because that. god is triune you can have god the father putting his words in the mouth of god the son who's also flesh and a man like moses where's the problem but it's going to get worse for this heretic this black stone licking pagan go now go now if you can to john 12 49 to 50 Read 47 to 50. It's 49 50, but read John 12, 47 to 50. 
But but although he hath done so many John signs 12, before them. Uh, 47 John. to 50, not 37. Oh, 47. You're reading 37. And if, in, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge, judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judge, judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Wow, doesn't that sound like the prophet like Moses? Yes. <laughs> well, interesting. Exactly. I'll go to John 14, 31. I'm going to give you a few more. Fourteen forty one. Fourteen thirty one. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so do I. Arise, let wait, us go wait, from wait. here. The world will know that I love the Father. Why? Read that part again. But the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so do I. So I do. So I do. Wait. Arise. So that sounds like the prophet, like Moses, whom God would put in his words in his mouth, and he would speak the words of God, and the people had to obey it. Interesting, huh? Yes. So John fifteen verses nine to ten. John fifteen verses nine to ten. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. My goodness, that sure sounds like Jesus is like Moses. And that like Moses, he only spoke the commands of God, the Father. And he only did what God, the Father, commanded him. And like Moses, he's also God because Moses was God to Pharaoh and Aaron was his prophet. Whereas Moses was simply God in function, Jesus is God in nature. Where's the problem, you fake Ali Atai? <laughs> now, do you want me to show you why Deuteronomy proves that Muhammad is an antichrist, the son of the devil? Yes, please. Okay. We would all agree that the prophet like Moses would have to agree with the theology of Moses, right? Yes. We'd all have to agree that you can't have a prophet uh, so, like Moses if he contradicts Moses' theology, right? Yes, right. Okay. Go to Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. Okay, so you are the children... Of the Lord your God. Now go to Deuteronomy 32 verse 6. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought, who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? So he is their father, right? Yes. Now read Deuteronomy 32, same chapter, verses 18 and 20. You're, you're going to see where I'm going with this. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocations of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, uh, children in whom is no faith. Okay. God says... I fathered Israel, I begot Israel, they are my sons and daughters, but they are perverse. And then in Exodus 4, 22, 23, what did God tell Moses to tell Pharaoh? Go to Exodus 4, 22 to 23. <clears throat> Watch here. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. 
but if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. I'm confused, brother. The God of Moses is a spiritual father to his people Israel. They are his spiritual sons and daughters. And he gave birth to them, begot them spiritually. Not physically, because he's not a physical being. He doesn't have sex. But the God of Moses is a father to no one. He says, Jews and Christians are not my sons and daughters. <clears throat> Jesus is not my son. The highest relationship you can have with me is a slave to master relationship. How then can Muhammad be the prophet like Moses when his God is not like the God of Moses? The God of Moses begets spiritually, not sexually. He's not a physical being. He doesn't have sex. That's blasphemy. The God of Moses has sons and daughters. He's the father of Israel. Israel is his son. Allah says he doesn't beget. He's not begotten. The Jews and Christians are not my sons. The highest relationship you can have with me is a slave to master relationship. Write down the verses from the Quran. I'm going to give it to you. Ready? <clears throat> Pray for my voice, yes. guys. It's about to give up. I'm getting old. Holy Spirit, speak perfect life to my throat. Rebuke attacks against it in Jesus' name. Okay. Write down these verses from the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 18. You got that? Yes. Chapter 9, verse 30. Got it. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Yes. Chapter 39, verse 4. Got it. And then chapter 72, verse 3. Got it. How in the world can Muhammad be a prophet like Moses when he contradicts the theology of Moses and the spiritual fatherhood of God he denies? Hmm. Now, let me give you a final example for the sake of time. I can go on all day with this. Go to Deuteronomy 24, read verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure. Boy, my voice. 24 to 4? Yeah, 24 verses 1 of 4. 1 of 4. Ah, uh, yeah. Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 of 4. When a man uh, takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, put it, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed, from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. If the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after, after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which <clears throat> the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Wow. God says, when I divorce my wife, she marries the second time. I cannot take her back if she gets divorced to that second husband or he dies. That's an abomination. It's disgusting. God hates it, right? Yes. But write down chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 230. Chapter 2, verse 230. Right? Yeah. Can I read it? Yo, you got the Quran? Read chapter 2, verse yes. 230. Go ahead. Uh, Pictal or? Yeah, Pictal. Read Pictal. And if he hath divorced her the third time, then she is not unlawful. She is not lawful unto him thereafter until she had wedded another, uh, another husband. Then if he... The other husband divorced her. It is no sin for both of them that they come together again if they consider consider that they are able to observe the limits of Allah. Wow. These are the limits of Allah. Hold on. He I'm confused. Finish it. Go ahead. Finish it. First, verse 30. Two uh, he manifesteth them for people who have knowledge. Wow. Okay, brother. I'm confused. The God of Muhammad says, if I divorce my wife irrevocably, I cannot remarry her until she marries another man. And according yes. to the Hadith, Muhammad says, not only marry another man, but that man has to have sex with her. Have sex 
actual intercourse with her. And then if he divorces her, only then I can take her back. The God of Moses says, you do that, you're disgusting, you're pervert, you're an abomination. How then can Muhammad be the prophet like Moses when his fake God orders something that the true God of Moses says is disgusting, it's an abomination, I hate it, don't do it. Exactly, and I think Jesus condemns uh, Muhammad in Matthew 19, 9 for this very yep. reason. And Jesus condemned Muhammad to hell because he lusted for his adopted son's wife, committing adultery in his heart, causing them to divorce and marrying her, according to Matthew 5, <clears throat> 27 to 28, 31 to 32. When you think of a married woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. And when you marry that woman that the man is divorced for a reason other than sexual morality, you then make her an adulteress because the marriage is still bound in the sight of God. So both Moses and Jesus condemn Muhammad to hell as a son of the devil and Allah of the Quran as Satan himself, Muhammad's true father. And yet Ali Atai wants to convince you Muhammad is the prophet like Moses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, brother, excellent questions. What I want you to do for me during the week, contact me. If you have more questions from that lecture, contact me. Because I want to go live to destroy his arguments. Yes, I have more, um, but I have to write down like 20 minutes of okay. the last part. Do, do, do this. Write them down. Contact me sometime tomorrow. Lord willing, I'll go live with you and just answer the questions. Okay. All right, brother? Okay, see. Because okay. you're going to save me okay. time from watching him. I don't want to watch him. If you're going to watch him, you're going to save me time. Yes, he, he's a clown. All right, brother. If you have one final question, I can take it. Or if you want to wait till tomorrow, it's up to you. Uh, this is not related to the topic, okay. but I, I've i heard uh, this clown, Tobias Singer, say that nowhere in the Old Testament is um, uh, um, speaking of uh, the Messiah saying Nazarene. Uh, well, that, because... oh my goodness. if you go to Matthew 2.23, look it up, brother. Yeah. Yes. He, this shows he can't read. The guy can't read. Matthew 2.23, Tovia Singer says, there's nowhere in the Hebrew scripture says he's a Nazarene. Okay, read Matthew 2.23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now I want you to pay attention to the formula. And I want everyone to listen, because you got to learn this argument. In Matthew 2.23, Matthew says the prophets predicted Messiah would be a Nazarene. Here's my challenge to every one of you. I want you to start reading from Matthew 1 to 2. Whenever Matthew quotes an actual prophecy, he says this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet singular. He doesn't use prophets plural. Did you notice here he says prophets plural? Yes. So right there, if you're paying attention carefully, he's not referring to any specific prophecy of a prophet. He's saying this was to fulfill what the prophets said. He shall be called the Nazarene. Now, unless Matthew thinks that you have several prophets all saying he shall be called the Nazarene, that shows that Tovia Singer can't read. You caught it? Yes. <laughs> it's not an actual prophecy in those words. Otherwise, Matthew would be implying more than one prophet said those words, he'll be a Nazarene. He's telling you that the prophets have, in general, mentioned the fact that Jesus is a Nazarene. Now, does Matthew mean the word Nazarene appears there? Or does Matthew mean that the prophet spoke of the Messiah, who is Jesus, in such a way that we shouldn't be surprised that he ends up being associated with Nazareth as a Nazarene. Why? Because the prophets talked about the Messiah being humble and humiliated, right? Yes. <laughs> Isaiah 52 and other passages that talk about him being humble. Humiliated, debased, rejected, condemned, scorned. Psalm 22, Daniel 9, right? The word Nazarene isn't 
referring to an actual prophecy where several prophets use the word Nazarene. The word Nazarene is associated with the Messiah being humbled, humiliated, debased, rejected, accursed, condemned. And that is stated in Psalm 22. I'm a worm and not a man. Isaiah 52, beaten beyond human semblance. And the, the Israelites considered him accursed of God, smitten by God, condemned by God. Daniel 9, Messiah cut off, humiliated but not for himself, so on and so forth. How do I know <clears throat> Nazarene is meant to convey Messiah's humiliation? Because Nazareth was, was viewed by zealous Jews as a place of ill repute, as less than ideal place to live in. How do I know? Go to John 1, 45 and 46. I'm losing my voice, guys, so pray for me. John 1, 45, 1, 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael, Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now you see why he's called Nazarene? Because he comes from a place that even the Jews look down upon and scorn as the less than ideal state for the Messiah to come out of. Messiah would come out of such a place? So even his dwelling in Nazareth fulfills the prophecy that says Messiah would be humiliated, would be abased, would be humble, would be lowly, and wouldn't have anything that would attract people to him. So he's not called Nazarene as an actual name mentioned in the prophecies. Nazarene is being used in a derogatory sense, meaning of all places that he came forth, he comes out of that one place that even the Jews looked down upon as an indication of what the prophets say. He would be humble, lowly, humiliated, abased, and debased. Making sense or no? Yes. So my challenge to the idiot Tobia Singer is, can you show me when... Matthew is appealing to an actual prophecy. He uses the word prophets, plural, as opposed to prophet, singular. He doesn't. When he's talking about a prophecy, he says, this is what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Don't take my word for it. Go to Matthew 122. Read it. Uh, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying. Singular. Is it prophets? No. Okay. And then he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. Now go to Matthew 2, 15. And was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt, Singular I call my son. Prophet, right? Yes. Now continue from 16 all the way to 20. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise man, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Singular. Mm -hmm. So saying. Now, if you had read all the way up, then. Matthew expects you now to notice the difference in 23. Now read 23. Uh, read uh, the rest of it? Or? No, no, just read 23 because you caught it. Jeremiah the prophet, the prophet, the prophet, singular, right? Yes. Now notice the difference in 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. Now why did he change plural? 
because he's not referring to any specific prophecy with that name. You caught it now? Yes. You saw what Nathaniel said about Nazareth. Can anything good come out of it? In other words, Nazarene signified that the Messiah wouldn't come in the glory of a king. He would come humble, lowly, abased, debased, humiliated, which is why, of all places, he comes out of Nazareth, the very place that the Jews looked down upon with disgust. Mm -hmm. So he's telling you that the prophets essentially prophesied that Messiah would be of such lowly status, humble status, that he would actually choose to come out of a place that was looked down upon, a place that wasn't viewed as being a place you would expect the king of glory to come out of. Nazareth. So Nazarene signified Messiah being humble and lowly of no reputation. It had nothing to do with the actual word appearing in the prophets. Do you think Matthew really meant that more than one prophet used the word Nazarene? Of course not. Making sense or not? Yes, making sense. Making sense. <laughs> Is it sinking in? I don't want to move on until it sinks in. <clears throat> making sense. You got it or are you still a little confused? No, I got it. You see prophets. Do you really expect Matthew to believe more than one prophet said Nazarene? No. So he's telling you that the overall gist of the prophetic message is that Messiah would be lowly, humble, humble, humiliated, debased, and abased. And that's signified by the fact he comes out of Nazareth, a place that was looked down upon, that was considered to be of no use, especially for the Messiah to come out of. That's it? Yes, I got it. So thank the Lord Jesus. But Tobia Singer, he's a demon like Ali. Their father's the same, Satan, unless and until they repent. So, yes. Excellent questions, brother. Contact you, me to, tomorrow when you're ready. We'll go live and we'll destroy Aliate for the glory of Jesus. God willing. Thank you, brother. Excellent questions. Lord bless you. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, folks. Uh, as you can see, I'm under the weather. Thank the Lord Jesus. I'm feeling a lot better. I thought I may have had COVID, but through your prayers to the merciful Lord Jesus who doesn't need me. I'm feeling a lot better, but my throat is not what it used to be. So do pray hard and intensely for my daughters and I. Ask the Lord Jesus to give us perfect health, to enable me to continue to get healthier, keep this weight off. Ask the Lord Jesus in his mercy to give my throat perfect life, vitality, vigor from the Holy Spirit, that my voice will never go out until the Lord takes me home. Ask the Lord to fill my lungs, my chest, my throat, my heart, arteries with the breath of life, life from the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord Jesus to strengthen my voice and my sight that I use my eyes to study the word. Ask the Lord Jesus to protect my children, to feed them, provide for them. Ask the Lord to bless this ministry, to provide for this ministry. If he wants me to do it until Jesus calls me, that I never shame Jesus, blaspheme Jesus, betray Jesus. Ask the Lord to make me holy and truly obedient to his word and love his word and live it out. And as long as he does, I will serve you for the glory of Jesus Christ. We had 400 people for this stream, 500 for the debate, and we had about 400 earlier. Thank you. Pray the numbers increase for the glory of Christ. And re-watch this, re-re-watch this until it becomes second nature. Make sure you've understood what you heard. Don't mishear, misunderstand, and then misinform. Ask the Spirit to help you understand correctly, absorb it, teach it. You don't need to ask me. You can upload all my sessions, all my articles to your channels and sites as long as you distribute this freely for the glory of Jesus. <clears throat> Name the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, grant us the perfect health we need spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. Nourish and feed us to feast off the flesh and blood of the, G of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that for my daughters, our loved ones. Please, Father, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, fill my throat with life. Rebuke Satan who wants to attack it. Keep it strong and healthy. 
and use it to glorify Jesus Christ. We love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. Maran athe, Lord Jesus, comes sooner than later. You are alive, and you will never die. And we trust in you, and we love you. Thank you, risen Lord of glory, Son of God. Amen. Take care, guys.